You know how a lot of people talk about talent all the time? We definitely need the pieces to win. Now, talent doesn't guarantee you wins. Like Mima always said, a good foundation does not guarantee a mansion, but no mansion is built without a foundation. Thank you, Mima. And she was right about that. And likewise, with college football rosters, not every five-star upon five-star equals eventual national championship, but yet every national championship winning team, you look back and you can take away certain characteristics from them. And Bud Elliott does the whole blue chip ratio thing every year, which we're about 72 hours post-release of for 2023, but I haven't gotten to speak to you since that came out. And so I always like to look at it, and there are some familiar faces at the top. And sometimes there are some new arrivals and maybe some that just fell off the cliff. Florida State's not in this thing, for example. And yet they're one of the favorites in this conference, in the ACC. They're, they're a fringe playoff contender this year. So what does this all mean? Like how much talent do you really have to have, according to history, to win a national championship? Well, the blue chip ratio, if you're listening on pod, I'll explain it to you. If you're watching, I have it on the screen right here for you. It's just the teams that have recruited more blue chip players than not. So we're looking at your roster, four and five star players. Do you have more of those than you have players rated below that? It's like the most simple formula ever. But history shows that if you don't, you're not winning a national championship, or at least you haven't. I'm sure there could always be one in the future. Like I said, no one, and I know what the comment section is going to look like, but I'll repeat it anyway. No one is suggesting that this is the end all be all, and this will be your top 15 at the end of the year. It's nothing like that. But history has shown us that having a roster that meets a certain line in the sand is a prerequisite to winning a national championship. Okay, so first thing that stood out to me when I was looking at this this week is Clemson's still right there. In fact, Texas A&M's right there. I think Clemson being there may not shock a ton of you, although there's a feel out there in the neighborhood that they may have fallen off a little bit. In terms of just raw talent, they haven't fallen off all that much at all. Now, what you do with that talent, how it's developed, is it dispersed evenly over key position groups, i.e. wide receiver? Maybe not so much lately, although they've had quite a haul at wide receiver over the past week on the recruiting trail. We'll talk about that later in the show. But look at Clemson there. 72% of their roster made up a four- and five-star. And likewise, Texas A&M, it's the fourth highest team graded on here. Bama's in like another universe. Ohio State tops in the Big Ten. Georgia's there at 77%. And then you just like drop your pen and you say, why did they put A&M's logo there? Because Texas A&M is at 77% or 73% right now. So then that makes you stroke your chin and you just ask yourself, what are they doing? You want to know why I talk about there being no patience? I'm the one that always preaches patience. There's no patience there because you got a, a coaching staff. you got a head coach over half a decade into his tenure with allegedly one of the most talented rosters in America. And the reason that I say allegedly sarcastically is because it's true. Those kids that are on A&M's roster, they all had offers from Georgia. They all had offers from Florida State and Miami and Ohio State. So everyone wanted them. So, so the, the whole country wasn't fooled by those kids. They just haven't put them together and haven't developed them. And also, offensively, they've been operating from a playbook that was developed in the um, Depression era. And so they look to rectify that with the hiring of Bobby Petrino, which will be ultra interesting because it's the exact same thing Clemson just did. They just went and got Garrett Riley from TCU. And if you want like one of the big storylines for the storyline crowd out there to watch, it's look at the OC situation in College Station, look at the OC situation in Clemson, South Carolina, and then understand if one of them goes like that, if one of them goes bang, the ingredients are already there. So we understand what it takes to cook you got a shelf full of it. you got a cabinet full of it in two places that underachieved mightily offensively last year. What could happen? You lose five games by six points or less if you're A&M last year. What could happen if all of a sudden you bump up your offensive production by like 15%? I don't know. I mean, I guess math would indicate a lot of close wins all of a sudden. I also look at Bama, and it's really, really a fun time of year right now if you're me, because all I have to do is just talk in the mic and say, well, I look at the six highest rated classes of all time. All time, repeat for emphasis. Three of them are baked into Bama's roster right now. And yet the streets are telling me they've kind of fallen off a little bit. Roster's not quite what it used to be. And I'm like, I could listen to you. I could look at what the calculator says. I could trust my instincts. And I think what a lot of people are seeing is they're seeing the quarterback position in a state of flux. And then they're kind of cast in that shade across that entire roster. And meanwhile, I look and they got like half a dozen five-star rated players just at the edge position. That's not a made-up stat, by the way. That's reality. And I look across the rest 
of the roster. And the thing about it is even the transfer portal has not eroded this. In fact, I mean, Bud put it in the article. You can find this on 247sports.com right now. If you factor in the kids who have transferred out of Alabama and you then adjust this blue chip rating for transfers, they're still at 88%. Let me translate that for you, kids. If you take the dudes that Bama signed that aren't on campus anymore and you remove them from the roster, they still have a higher blue chip ratio than the next closest team does without removing their departures in the transfer portal. And so Alabama comes into this year. It's always a really fun time of year when people doubt them nationally for me because I'm not foolish enough to do it. I may not pick them to win the title, but I'm certainly not going to doubt them. We've got a bold prediction on the show later tonight where one of you claims they're going to go eight and four. So that's always fun for me, really fun for me, because I know better. Florida State's not on this. This is, to me, the most interesting takeaway. Florida State, even with all the work they've done in the transfer portal, their blue chip ratio right now is at 41%. History says that's not good enough to win a national championship. Vegas odds put them right in the thick of that college football playoff race. Any given day, they're either the favorite or the co-favorite or a close second to win the ACC. I think right now they're the odds on favorite to do it according to Caesars. And so you have to ask yourself, can they or can't they? Obviously, but then what do these metrics tell me? And I always have to go back to that thing that I tell you all the time, and that is don't be married to this whole cannot thing when we really just live in a world maybe of haven'ts. No one has. We have not seen someone break through the old blue chip ratio wall. Doesn't mean they couldn't. But at the same time, as much as Florida State's roster, as much as their starting 22 may be void of massive question marks, we also understand the quality depth you have to have to make it at that level. Now, we're talking about winning a championship, not talking about pushing to win 10 games. So rarefied air is what we're talking about here. You get in that scenario, and you understand TCU found this out, for instance. You understand that their twos, whoever you're playing against, there's not a big drop-off, uh, especially we go to national championship games all the time. We go to playoff games. You look at the fronts, and you look at the rotational guys they bring in, and there are twos that you look at, and you say, what's the difference? Fractions, that's the difference. And sometimes they roll three deep on some of these teams like Georgia or Bama when they get in those championship games, and they also get December to get a lot of those guys healthy. So it's a pretty incredible thing. So anyway, I'm saying all that to say, is that where Florida State is? That's what we're going to play the games for. That's what God made fall for. But they're not on this list, even with the adjustment for transfer portal. They're not on the list, so something would have to give there. Oregon's a powerhouse recruiter. They are that. Uh, the staff that's here right, Mario Cristobal's here right now. He took them to another level when he was at Miami. It was so, when he was at Oregon, it was so imperative when he came to Miami that they got someone and plugged him in that understood how to keep that thing rolling. And Dan Lanning's done that, and his staff has done that. And as long as they harness the resources out there, they're not going anywhere. That's why when I hear those rumors about maybe Oregon to the Big Ten, I say, well, they fit seamlessly already. Uh, they are, even when you count for USC, they're the best recruiting power on the West Coast right now. Lincoln Riley and company could change that, uh, but it hadn't changed yet. And Oregon's not slowing down, so, so someone's going to have to catch them. But I, I listen to those rumors and I'm not one to root for the Big 12 or the Pac-12's implosion, Pac-12 paid after all, but I, I think about what it would look like if I snapped my fingers and Oregon was just in the Big Ten tomorrow. Outside of Ohio State, they'd be the best recruiter there. Do you understand that? Does everyone get that? Like Penn State's pretty good right now. Michigan's pretty good right now. Oregon's a little bit better than pretty good right now. And they're in the Pacific Northwest, uh, separated from virtually every talented player in America, and they are, like I said, so you save you some time in the comments, harnessing the resources at their disposal, which is the name of the game now. We do it at Pate State, they do it at Oregon, same way. That's the name of the game, and they're doing that, and they're keeping themselves the blue chip ratio. In fact, I would probably not be surprised if uh, they ticked ahead of that 70% barrier before too much longer. Uh, one more thing I wanted to mention to you before we move on. Uh, Colin, all the way back in Nashville, bless his heart, could you just do me a favor and throw up the initial list right quick of the top 15? I, I know you guys probably noticed this, but if you didn't, I want you to take special note of the fact that OU and Texas are right there in the seven and eight positions. They'll be in the SEC in about five minutes. So I had stats and info count, and it turns out if you 
include OU and Texas, eight of these top 15 teams here are SEC teams. That's not a surprise, Josh. They recruit different level in the SEC. Oh, I know that. You don't have to tell me that. I think I have to tell some of the more casual-minded amongst us sometimes that you're not always what your record says you are. It's one of the big lies in college football. A win is not always a win. A loss is not always a loss. It's one of the other big lies that is told in college football. It's a pro sports mentality that bleeds over into college football. So I want you to picture this. Fast forward, it's 2026. OU and Texas are in the SEC. You draw six out of those eight teams on your schedule. This is going to be a common occurrence, by the way. Like someone down there any given year is playing six or maybe seven of those teams. Not all of them are going to be good record-wise. It's mathematically impossible. There aren't enough wins to go around because they all play each other, even if it's only eight times a year. They all play each other. So my question to you is this. If you run up on Texas A&M, but they're tracking for a 7-5 and five season, does it really make the players any less athletically gifted when you play them on a Saturday? Does it make your training room any less full on that Sunday morning following that game? Did it make the collisions any less violent and brutal? The answer is no. But some people would lead you to believe that because that team is tracking for 7-5, and five, it's the exact same as if you would have faced a team in the MAC that's tracking for seven and five. Why? Because you are what your record says you are. That committee, if they're not led in a more proper direction, would interpret that game as nothing more than a win over a team that you, that you should have skull drugged. You should have body bagged them. Why? Because they're only seven and five. They're tracking for seven and five. But the difference is they got two corners that are gonna go day one of the draft. They likewise have four guys in the two deep on defense, especially on the front where this matters the most, that would fit that same description. That left tackle and that right guard are going to be day two selections. And all the while, I'm watching it because I go to some of these games and I see some of these teams that are tracking for a pretty average year record-wise. And I say, first off, I cannot believe that that group of athletes is not going to accomplish more. But on any given Saturday, it also doesn't matter because those rosters that are chock full of those future Sunday guys, those are still future Sunday guys even if the team they're on is not putting up a more impressive number in the win column. So, when you hear me talk about the SEC going to nine games versus staying at eight games in conference play, I want them to go to nine. And I looked at this, and it just reinforced my belief, man, I'd love to see more of those teams play each other. My hang-up is not whether you can make a bowl game. Don't care. My hang-up is not whether ESPN pays you a dime more money because I don't care because it doesn't go in my pocket. But I do care that that committee four teams or 12 teams, properly understands how to interpret strength of schedule. Because if we get into a world in the future where Oregon State is 11-1 and one and LSU sitting 9-3 and three with three-point losses to Bama and uh, Texas, and I got a committee member saying, well, we, what do you expect us to do? Compare a 9-3 and three team to an 11-1 and one team? I will toss the laptop in a lake somewhere because I can't stand that. And that's a lot of the talk that happens in this sport in December sometimes. So the blue chip ratio, if you, if you want to look at it again, it's on 247sports.com. Always really interesting. That FSU conundrum that some of you are going to find yourselves in, maybe me, maybe I'll pick them to win the ACC. Who knows? But if you're picking them to do more than that, you're picking the Knowles to go playoff, maybe national championship. It's not that it's impossible. It's just that they're going to have to do something that no other team's ever done. 